Hey guys, this is Peter with the Command Valley bringing you another Commander Deck Tech. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video. If you want to check out their store and support the channel while doing it, check out the link in the description below. We have a copy and pasteable deck list in the description that you can paste right into their deck builder and buy your singles there. If you want to support us directly, head on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to sign up today. We're coming close to Strixhaven. Strixhaven spoilers have already started, but we've got one more Time Spiral Remastered Deck Tech coming to you before we start on our Strixhaven deck techs and upgrade videos for the Commander Precons. Today I have built a budget Grenzo Dungeon Warden deck. Grenzo is a legendary creature goblin rogue. He's a 2-2 that costs X, a black, and a red. Grenzo enters with X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, and you can pay 2 and put the bottom card of your library into your graveyard, and if it's a creature card with power less than or equal to Grenzo's power, put it onto the battlefield. Grenzo might be my most favorite Rakdos commander that I have ever built. Longtime watchers of the podcast will know that I've been trying my hand at Rakdos builds in the past, which is a newer color combo for me to explore, not really something that I'm a particular fan of, and I'm trying to find my right niche for this. Grenzo ticks all the right boxes for me, as a commander with a unique strategy, unique card pool, and a bunch of really powerful synergies without having to dump a lot of cash into it, which is exactly why I've decided to build a budget version of Grenzo for this deck. This is about $50. It's a little bit more after some tweaking, but it's in the $50 to $55 range. Our main goal of this deck is just to fuel Grenzo as much as we can. Grenzo in this deck optimally works at about four power. So we're going to try to get him out with four power on the board, and then we're going to start digging and getting powerful effects on the battlefield from the bottom of our library. We've got lots of bottom of deck manipulation, and we've got some ways of making a combo that is just janky enough that I love it. And don't worry, for those who want to power up the deck even more, I've got some more suggestions toward the end of the video that aren't budget friendly that you can include. Let's get right into the meat of it with our bottom of deck manipulation cards. So these are cards typically that will move a card from our graveyard to the bottom of our library. There are a couple of exceptions and some of them will get cards from the top of the library onto the bottom and some of them will bring cards from the battlefield onto the bottom of our library. But the main goal is that we're choosing which cards go onto the bottom of our library and that's really what we're trying to do here. There are a bunch of things here that I'll talk about a little bit later as well so I won't dwell too much on the details on some of them because they're important for combos or they're more valuable in other sections as well. First we have Canal Dredger which has a draft ability that doesn't really matter here, but you can tap it to put a card from your graveyard into the bottom of the library. Next, we have Chainer Nightmare Adept, with, which isn't putting stuff on the bottom of our library, but it does enable this strategy quite a lot. First, we can discard cards to feed into cards like Canal Dredger that can put cards from graveyards in onto the bottom of our library. Additionally, we can give all of our creatures haste that come into the battlefield from the bottom of the library. So we don't even have to do the whole, you can cast a creature card from your graveyard this turn effect from its first effect. That second effect is really useful just for what we're already doing. And so even if you don't have stuff to discard or you don't have stuff that will put stuff from the graveyard to the bottom of your library. Chainer is still really useful to have on the battlefield. Next, we have Clone Shell, which is one of my most surprising picks for this deck, but I'm going to go into a little bit later when we talk about card advantage. Likewise, we have Epitaph Golem, which will put a card from our graveyard on the bottom of our library. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later as well, because it has some applicability in our, in our combos. Moving on, we have Junk Troller, which will tap and put a card from our graveyard to the bottom of our library. We can also do this to other people, but we're mainly going to be doing it to ourselves. That's the last of our creatures, but for our spells, we've got Blood Price, which will let us look at the top four cards of our library, put two of them in our hand, and put the rest on the bottom of our library in any order. And that will let us choose the creatures 
from that pile, put them on the bottom, and put the rest of the cards in our hand. Next, we've got Read the Bones. Scry is really, really good for this because we can look at the top of our library, put something on the bottom of our library if it's a creature. We'll want to make sure that whenever we're scrying, we are putting only creatures on the bottom so that we can bring them out with Grenzo and not land. So even if you see two lands on the top with your Read the Bones, you should put those into your hand because they're going to be more useful in your hand than on the bottom of your library. Next, we have Fire Prophecy, which is a card that I kind of overlooked when we were looking at Ikoria, but I could see it had some potential somewhere, and this is exactly where it has potential. First, it has some interaction, so it does some damage to a creature, and then you can put a card from your hand on the bottom of your library and draw a card. So it's doing a whole bunch of things that you already want to be doing. You can dump one of your creatures that's stuck in your hand, back to the bottom of the library where it belongs. Next, we've got Valakut Awakening, a popular card, and it is more on the expensive side, but it is really, really good in this deck. Not only is it a land on the other side if you really, really need it, but it will put any number of cards from our hand on the bottom of our library, and then we draw that many cards plus one. And that's going to be really helpful for dumping all of the creatures that get stuck in our hand and are easier to cast when they're on the bottom of our library. Moving on to artifacts, we have quite a few in the artifacts category. We've got Conjurer's Bobble, which is a one-time put a card from our graveyard on the bottom of our library, but it also draws us a card, so I think it's kind of a cantrip, kind of worth it for this deck. Next, we've got Crystal Ball, which will let us scry two for one, pretty good value. We've also got Dark Steel Pendant, which will let us scry one for one, which is less good than Crystal Ball, but it's indestructible and we can keep it around, so I feel like that's pretty nice. Next, we've got Rito Lantern, which we can pay three to put a card from our graveyard on the bottom of our library, and we don't have to tap it or anything, so we can do this as many times as we want and have mana for. We've also got Tel Jalad Stylus, which will tap and put a permanent we own on the bottom of our library, which is really unique because we can recur a powerful enter the battlefield effect, recur some interaction, whatever we need at the time, this is really helpful to do. And finally, we've got Teferi's Puzzle Box, which is probably the most expensive card in the deck, but just like Valakut Awakening is really worth it. You get to cycle the cards in your hand and you get to choose to put the creatures from your hand on the very bottom, and then you can just pay a whole bunch of mana into Grenzo to get the back onto the battlefield. And usually in this case, I found that you've, you have two, maybe three creatures in your hand. So the usual line of play is you get your Grenzo out with four mana, get your Teferi's Puzzle Box out the next turn, and then on the next turn, hopefully you'll have six mana and you can get three creatures from the bottom onto the battlefield, which is really powerful. All right, that's it for our bottom of deck manipulation. We're going to move on to the aristocrats section. So since we have a lot of things that want to be in the graveyard in order to get into our library, we're going to have to have some ways to sacrifice them. And we may as well have some death triggers to go along with that. So this is basically everything that has to do with putting cards in the graveyard from our battlefield and getting some payoffs from that. We've got a whole bunch of free sack outlets with Carrion Feeder, Flesh Eater Imp, Immerstrom Predator, Viserysir, and Woe Strider. All of those we can sacrifice any number of creatures to, and they have some sort of effect. Viserysir is really nice because it lets us scry, and that's another thing that we really want to do in this deck. Flesh Eater Imp is also crazy in this deck if we can somehow loop a creature by sacrificing it, putting it on the bottom of our library and then bringing it back out. We can do that a whole bunch of times and we can get Flesh Eater Imp really high and maybe that's an alternate win con if you want to go the infect route. Next, we've got Deathbringer Thoktar, which has a death trigger that will get plus one, plus one counters on it whenever a creature dies. That's really useful to have around, and it can allow us to do some pinging if it has enough plus one, plus one counters on it. We've also got Plague Crafter and Fleshbag Marauder. Both of these will let us have a one-time sacrifice effect, and this is really nice to recur with Grenzo, and will get us some extra value that way. Next, we've got Judith the Scourge Diva, Carter Doom Scourge, and... Zula Port Cutthroat, all of which will trigger whenever something dies. Carter is only attacking creatures, but it also is affected by other people's creatures. And this will just help us where when we're cycling things from our battlefield to the graveyard, to the bottom of our library, to the battlefield. 
uh, that we can get some extra value off of that. You can also include other Blood Artist effects in here, like Blood Artist itself, but these are the budget options that I chose. Last two cards in this category, I have Living Death, which will let us sacrifice all of our creatures and return the creatures that are in our graveyard to the battlefield. And this is nice if we suffer from a board wipe or something like that, it gets a whole bunch of creatures back. And that's really, really nice to have. And then we've also got High Market, which is a land and our only non-basic land in the deck. And it's just a cheap sacrifice a creature effect that we can have on a land. All right, next we've got our ramp section. So we have a whole bunch of creatures that are easy to get from the bottom of the library that are really useful here. We've got Burnished Heart, which is great because it sacrifices itself and we can recur that that way. We've also got Iron Mirror, Leaden Mirror, and Palladium Mirror for some mana fixing and some extra mana there. Next, we've got Solemn Simulacrum, which will search us up a basic land. And when it dies, we draw a card, really valuable to cycle around. And that's it for our creatures. For our spells, we've just got the one Dark Ritual, which I've found really, really useful with some other lines in the deck. Maybe you just need a little bit of an extra push to get some more things off of the bottom of the library. Maybe you need to cast one more creature from your hand. Dark Ritual is really nice. I had Pyretic Ritual in this deck in an earlier draft, but I took it out for the sake of some other includes that I thought were more impactful. For our Mana Rocks, we've got Everflowing Chalice. Hedron Archive, Rakdos Signet, and Soul Ring. You'll notice a lot of colorless mana here, and that's okay because Grenzo just takes colorless mana to activate, and so if we want a bulk amount of mana, having color a lot of colorless is really preferable. We've also got Thran Turbine. It's a new favorite of mine. It will let us activate Grenzo in the upkeep. Uh, so if we have something sitting on the bottom of the library that we need to get out before our draw step, for instance, if we have a Teferi's Puzzle Box, that will give us the extra push to get there. Or it can just give us an extra activation on each of our turns. All right, next up, we've got our interaction section. So these are a lot of creatures that we can recur that will let us interact with the board. Mostly we're destroying things. We can't really interact with people's hands in this budget build. First, we've got Duplicant, which is fantastic in this deck. It's low power, so it can be grabbed with Grenzo, and it lets us exile any non-token creature. It's really valuable to have on the battlefield and on the bottom of the library. Ingot Chewer is really easy to evoke and get into the graveyard, and that's kind of important for a later thing because sometimes we do want creatures in our graveyard for certain things, but this is also really nice to be able to put on the bottom of the library and recur if we have a lot of artifacts that we're dealing with. Next, we've got Mind Claw Shaman, which is an interesting one. It costs five mana, but it's really low powered, which is why it's a good pick for our deck. And when it enters the battlefield, we make an opponent reveal their hand, and we can cast an instant or sorcery from that player's hand without paying its mana cost, which is really nice for clearing out counter spells. We can just cast it and let it fizzle and let it go to their graveyard, or we can get some value off of the cards that they have that are giving them value. I can find this really, really useful against a player like Griffin that I play against all the time that is playing all these cantrips and all of these counter spells. Really, really nice to get those out of his hand. Next, we've got Ravenous Chupacadra. Very simple, destroy a creature and opponent controls. Very nice to have. Same with Shriekma. It has some restrictions on what it can destroy, but it also has that evoke trigger. So if we need to get stuff into the graveyard, that's really nice. And finally, for our creatures, we've got Zagreus, Thief of Heartbeats, which is just on the cusp of being able to be grabbed by Grenzo, but it's a really powerful creature to have. It will first let us be able to take care of Planeswalkers, which is not super relevant in most metas, but it can be relevant here. And just having a flying hasty death toucher that's a 4-4 that's really easy to get out is really nice. And most of the time having our an entire board of death touchers, since we're going to have a lot of creatures, is going to protect us pretty well. For some instants and sorceries, we've got Blasphemous Act, which is really nice for dealing mass damage to the entire field. Crippling Fear, which is a card that I'm playing with to see if this is a really good pick here. It'll make... Everyone that's not a certain creature type, minus three, minus three. And that's that may be good in certain metas. That's going to wipe a whole bunch of tokens off of the board. Most of the time, I think I'm just going to choose something like Goblin or Rogue to save Grenzo. 
I'm interested to see what you guys think of this card and see how applicable it is in most metas. And then last, I've got Feed the Swarm because I need a way to deal with enchantments, and this is the best way that we have so far on a budget. Moving on, we are talking about our card advantage and our recursion package all kind of in the same area. So these are cards that either want us to recur things or give us some card advantage for other things or help us recur things from our graveyard if putting them on the bottom of our library isn't a uh, an option. Let's talk first about Tormod the Desecrator. He's one of the new commanders from Commander Legends, but he's really useful here because he can reward us for getting creatures out of our graveyard. So just putting them on the bottom of the library triggers this and we get an extra creature on the battlefield, help us swing at someone or something. Next, we've got Hoarding Dragon, which will let us search for an artifact, exile it, and then when the when Hoarding Dragon dies, we get that artifact. And so this is really helpful for finding some of our combo pieces or uh, just utility pieces that are really helpful to have. We do have to be a bit careful that someone doesn't exile the Hoarding Dragon, uh, so make sure that you have some sort of a sack outlet to be able to take care of the Hoarding Dragon before someone takes it out. We've also got Flamekin Herald, which is kind of a surprise include for me. It's pretty budget because it doesn't have a lot of utility in a lot of decks, but here it feels like a natural turn three play. Play it for three mana, and then the next turn play Grenzo get an extra card from our library onto the battlefield. Really nice to be able to just cast something for free from our library. I know that Cascade is kind of a variable return on investment, but this is also helpful later if we have to recast Grenzo or something like that, give us a little bit of extra value for having to cast our commander again. Now let's talk about Clone Shell again. So I already mentioned it earlier, but basically what it does is it lets us look at the top four cards of our library when it enters. We choose one of them, exile it under Clone Shell, and then put the rest on the bottom. Then when Clone Shell dies, we turn that exiled card face up, and if it's a creature, we put it onto the battlefield under our control. So a bunch of things can happen with this Clone Shell, and it's honestly like a really useful card in the deck. We, we can re This is one of the most useful things that we can recur, just continuing to get card advantage off of this. So first, we get those four cards on the top, and we look at them. If there's a creature among them, we put it under Clone Shell. If there's more than one creature among them, we put them on the bottom of the library and put the rest right above them uh, on the bottom of the library. If there's only one creature, that's totally fine. We, we just get the, the one creature under Clone Shell, and then when we take out Clone Shell, we can get that creature onto the battlefield. It's basically another Grenzo activation, but for the top of the library, which is super, super nice. And if we don't have any creatures in the top, well, we probably didn't want any of those cards anyways, so we can exile a land or something like that uh, just to weed out cards in our library. Clone Shell is an all-star in this deck, and I really, really love it. Uh, and it's a super great budget pick for Grenzo. Next, I've included Diabolic Tutor. Tutors are really good in this deck for finding our combo pieces because it is a combo deck primarily. We've also got Final Parting in here, which helps on that front as well. Uh, but we can't play very expensive tutors because it's a budget deck. So these are probably the two best tutors, Diabolic Tutor and Final Parting, that we can play in the deck. Next, we've got Dread Return, which is really, really nice here because if we accidentally mill it, we can still use it. Uh, it lets us return a creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield, and we can flash it back by sacrificing three creatures. So that's really nice to have if we have something stuck in the graveyard. Next, we've got Faithless Looting. It lets us draw some cards and discard some cards, get some cards into our graveyard that we can put on the bottom of our library, and we can flash it back to get some, a little bit more value. This is an early gameplay for sure. Next, we've got Victimize, which will let us choose two creatures in our graveyard, sacrifice a creature, and then bring those two creatures onto the battlefield. Really nice for basically all commander decks that want to do Reanimator. And then last, we've got Peer into the Abyss, which is kind of a wild card alternate win con here. This is going to let us draw half of our library and lose half of our life, which ultimately we're going to be dumping a whole bunch of cards back into our discard, but we're going to be able to have the fuel in our hand to be able to put the cards in our discard on the bottom, and hopefully we have our combo pieces in that half of a library that we drew. 
All right, moving on, we've got our combo and win cons. It just These are, are things that we want to see on the battlefield, best cards in the deck. I'll start with Grey Merchant of Asphodel because it's really a win con in its own, but it does require some other pieces in order to make it work. We have to be able to loop it, basically. So we, we get Grey Merchant of Asphodel on the battlefield, it does its draining, we sacrifice it, it goes... We put it on the bottom of the library with another thing, and then we use Grenzo to get it back out. And we just cycle that as much as we can. That's going to give us a lot of life and a lot of value. And if we can outvalue our opponents that way, that can definitely be a way to win. We've also got Hearthstone, which will reduce Grenzo's ability from 2 to 1, which makes it a whole lot easier to mill things from the bottom of our library and get them onto the battlefield. Now, the combo is kind of loose, but... There, it's basically an A plus B combo. For our A part, we're looking for either a combination of Epitaph Golem and Hearthstone, or the Cauldron of Eternity. Epitaph Golem and Hearthstone work really well together because Hearthstone will reduce the activated ability of both Grenzo and Epitaph Golem. So it costs only one to activate each of their abilities, and that's really important for our B part of the combo, which I'll get to in just a second. This will basically let us loop a card from our graveyard to the bottom of our library, to the battlefield, and and if we have a free sack outlet, we can get it back into the graveyard and repeat for only two mana, which is really, really powerful. The other A combo piece is the Cauldron of Eternity, which does cost a lot to cast, and this is why we wanted to have a way to have creatures stay in the graveyard occasionally, because that makes the cauldron cost cheaper. But if we get it out, then any time a creature dies, it goes to the bottom of the library instead. So just having a sack outlet and the cauldron of eternity will let us get a card on the bottom of the library and bring it back with Grenzo for only two mana as well. So either of these methods works great. The Cauldron of Eternity is obviously a bit better because it only requires one piece. So all three of these are artifacts that be can be tutored with artifact tutors like Hoarding Dragon. So if you want to put more artifact tutors in the deck, that will help you get this combo going. The B part of the combo that we want to get out is either Priest of Gix or Priest of Urbrask. Both of these are three mana creatures that generate three mana when they come onto the battlefield. If we can cycle these from the bottom of our library to the top for only two mana, we get infinite mana and infinite activations of Grenzo. That lets us basically mill our entire deck, get the aristocrat trigger that we need, Zulu Park Cutthroat or otherwise, and then continue to loop that until we win the game. For our mana base, I mentioned High Market earlier, and that's really the only non-basic land we have in here. The rest is just 18 mountains and 18 swamps. It's pretty important to have both of your colors so that Grenzo can come onto the battlefield, so we don't really have a preference one way or the other. If I did have to lean one way or the other, it would be towards black, because there's a lot more black in this deck than there is red. Uh, so I would lean in that direction if you were going to go in that direction. But most of the time, I haven't had a problem with finding the right colors that I need, mostly because Grenzo can always work with just any color of mana. All right, and now we're to the non-budget cards and the cards that are just not necessarily non-budget, but just maybe you want to consider them if you have a little bit of a higher threshold. Uh, some of them are, are just a little bit more expensive. First, let's start with Panharmonicon. Obviously, this is going to make all of our ETB effects a lot more powerful. So things like Priest of Gix and Priest of Urbrask are going to de generate double mana, or Grey Merchant of Asphodel is going to happen twice. Things like that are really useful to have in this deck. And so Panharmonicon is just uh, kind of a win more card, but it can also enable some pretty crazy loops uh, for pretty efficient. Next, we've got Dockside Extortionist and Workhorse. These are both creatures that we can loop with Grenzo pretty easily. And if we all, if you've seen how well Dockside Extortionist works in other metas, it generates a crazy amount of mana. And so this will probably, if we have the right board set up, fuel Grenzo forever. And, and these are just another example of a way that we can get infinite mana. Next, we've got Crypt Ghast and Nirkana Revenant. These are famously things that make swamps tap for more. If you do want to go more on the black side, add more swamps and add Crypt Gasp or Nirkana Revenant or maybe some Bubbling Muck, things like that to get more value out of your black mana. That's going to help you 
get more activations off of Grenzo and get more advantage in the long run. Next, we've got Illusionist Bracers, which will, if we attach it to Grenzo, get us two activations off of him for two mana every time. And that's going to be really powerful if we want to get through our deck really fast. And the last specific suggestion that I have is Mind Moil, which is an interesting card that I found. But essentially, it's an enchantment that will let us put the cards from our hand on the bottom of our library in any order and then draw them any cards whenever we play a spell, whenever we cast a spell. So that's really useful to have. It's kind of like a Teferi's puzzle box, but just whenever we cast a spell and we can choose to cast spells, we can choose to do stuff from, with Grenzo, but this is going to be really helpful for cycling stuff from our hand onto the bottom of our library to get out for cheaper mana. I would also recommend better tutors and card advantage. Black and red don't have very good options for, for card advantage and tutors unless you're paying a lot of money. So if you're going for a less budget deck, I would look at things like Necropotence and better tutors uh, to get your value out of that. And that's it for my Grenzo budget deck tech. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this deck tech. And if you want to support us directly and see more decks like this, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash command valley to sign up today. We have exclusive content, Discord, merch, other perks. We're producing gameplay videos featuring our patrons. Going to release them on the channel. So if you want to be a part of that, go check it out. And we would love to have you. Thank you again to GameGrid for sponsoring this video and all of the videos on our podcast. If you go through the affiliate link in the description, that will help the channel. If you purchase anything... We get a small commission from anything you purchase there. And if you want to buy any of the cards that you saw in this video, if you think they're a good idea for your Grenzo build, go and buy them there. They'll ship nationwide. You will get them really quickly. So go and check them out. And thank you to, again to GameGrid for always supporting us. Check out our social media for more updates on videos and other events that are going on, polls for our Q and A's that are coming up. We have over a hundred deck techs on the channel now. So make sure to go and check out our deck techs if you are interested in seeing more and stay tuned for more magic content, especially going into Strixhaven. We're so excited to see what Strixhaven has to offer. And we've already been really excited for the spoilers that we've seen so far. So we hope to see you next time on the next deck tech, on the next gameplay video, anything. Stay tuned here at the Command Valley.